go live to the floor of the U.S. Senate, starting the day with three hours of general speeches. Legislative work scheduled to begin at 5 o'clock with work on a bill to repeal a 3% with federal contractors and a procedural vote on that measure at 5.30. Live coverage of the U.S. Senate here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who governs all things in heaven and earth, mercifully hear our supplications and give us your peace. Lord, give our lawmakers this day the grace and wisdom to measure personal convictions in the light of truth and courage. Empower them to act consistent with enlightened conscience, however costly to personal ambition. Give them such a sense of duty that they may leave nothing they ought to do undone. Infuse them with a sense of gratitude that they may offer thanks to you by striving to do your will. We pray in your holy name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., November 7, 2011. To the Senate. Under provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Richard Blumenthal, a senator from the state of Connecticut, to perform the duties of the chair. Son Daniel K. Inouye, present pro tempore. Majority Leader. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka. Mr. President, the majority leader. Ask consent to call the quorum be terminated. Without objection. Following leader remarks, the Senate will be in a period of morning business till 5 p.m. Senators will be permitted to speak for up to 10 minutes each. Following morning business, Senate will resume consideration of H.R. 674. At approximately 5:30, the Senate will vote on motion to invoke cloture on the motion to proceed to that matter. <clears throat> Mr. President, every man or woman who puts on the uniform of the United States Armed Forces takes a solemn oath to support and defend the Constitution against all enemies. With that oath comes an obligation to defend the freedoms for which this noble nation stands and upon which it was founded without regard to personal price. And for this service, the United States makes a promise to our soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen in return. That promise isn't about flag waving or yellow ribbons. It lasts long after the parades and holidays are over through every day of every year of their lives. It's a guarantee that the American dream, for which every service member fights, for which many of their comrades have died, will be, await, will be waiting for them when they return. But since September 11, 2001, this country has allowed that promise to lapse. Today, there are 240,000 unemployed veterans. These are veterans of the fight against global terrorism. Among veterans who have served since September 11th, unemployment is more than 12 percent, more than three percentage points higher than among the general population. Among the youngest veterans, those under age 25, the unemployment rate 
is 22 percent. These young men and women volunteered to fight terrorism abroad, but their struggles didn't end when they came home. Despite their service and experience, a quarter of a million post-9-11 veterans can't find unemployment in today's dismal economy and rapidly changing workforce. It's time for this country to make good on its promise. As we pay tribute this week to the millions of American veterans who have faithfully served our flag, Democrats will introduce legislation to put those men and women back to work. Vow to fight heroes is the name of legislation. Vow to, fight, vow to hire heroes is the name of legislation. I misspoke, Mr. President. This will offer tax credits to companies who hire unemployed veterans or veterans who were discharged in the last five years. The legislation will give an additional tax credit to the firms that hire unemployed veterans with service-related disabilities. Disabled veterans will also be eligible for an additional year of vocational rehab and employment benefits under this legislation. The plan makes transition assistance, including resume writing workshops, career counseling, mandatory for all service members being discharged. Although our veterans are coming home with greater technical and leadership skills than ever before, those skills don't always translate to a civilian resume. This program will help bridge that gap. Many federal agencies, such as the VA and Homeland Security, badly need employees with unique skill veterans possess. This legislation will also make it possible for service members to apply for those jobs before they leave the military. This will allow soldiers to transition from serving their country in uniform to serving the civilian world without a gap in, it, in their employment. And to keep our promised older veterans, the legislation will expand education and training opportunities at community colleges and technical schools for 100,000 unemployed veterans who served before September 11th. Democrats believe we owe it to the men and women who have fought for us to fight for them here at home. Vow to hire heroes is our fourth attempt to pass common sense legislation that puts Americans back to work and helps jumpstart our economy. Senate Republicans unanimously opposed our last three jobs bills, although those bills had support of the vast majority of the Americans, Republicans, Democrats, and Independents alike. Meanwhile, Republicans have yet to propose a single idea of their own to create a job. Their obstruction has cost hundreds of thousands of teacher and first responders jobs. It has cost hundreds of thousands of construction jobs and put reconstruction of our nation's crumbling roads, bridges, and runways on hold. Now we'll see whether Senate Republicans are willing to put jobs for veterans at risk as well. I certainly hope they're not. I hope they'll join us this week in supporting the legislation that uses ideas originally proposed by Republicans and Democrats to put this nation's veterans back to work without adding a penny to the deficit. I believe every man and woman serving the Senate day is a patriot. I know every one, each and every one of us supports the members of the United States Armed Services and is grateful to every veteran who has served. This week, we have the opportunity to express our gratitude and our patriotism with action. So far, Republicans have stood firm against even the most reasonable plan to create millions of jobs for the sake of politics. But it's only a matter of time before they break and join Democrats in our effort to create jobs and get the economy back on track. As Veterans Day fast approaches, I urge my Republican colleagues to abandon partisanship and help us honor a commitment to this country's heroes. Mr. President, the Republican leader. For the past three years, <clears throat> President Obama and Democratic leaders here in Congress have spent most of their time pushing policies that actually undermine the private sector. They may have the best of intentions, but the fact is they made a bad economy worse. Unemployment has now stood at 9% for more than more consecutive months than for any other period since World War II. And there are now more than a million fewer jobs in, the, in this country than when the President's first stimulus bill was signed into law. So the American people gave the President a chance to do something about jobs and the economy, and he failed. That's why last year the American people put Republicans in charge of the House of Representatives so they could try a different approach. And that's just what they've done. For nearly a year now, House Republicans have been following through on their pledge to put Americans back to work by passing bill after bill aimed at helping businesses create jobs. 
The problem is, every time Republicans pass one of these bills over in the House, Democrats here in the Senate refuse to take it up. The Democrats who run the Senate are just letting all of these bills die. Some people want to know why this is happening. They want to know why the Senate won't take these bills up. Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. President Obama and his political advisors <clears throat> have put out the word that they don't want Congress to get anything done around here until after next year's election. So the president can go around on a bus and blame Congress for the country's problems. And Democrats in the Senate are lining right up behind him. They're doing the president's bidding. But that's not stopping Republicans in the House from doing the work they were elected to do. And it's not going to keep Repub the Republican minority here in the Senate from calling on Democrats to act. To date, House Republicans have passed more than 20 pieces of legislation designed to do two things. Make it easier for small businesses to create jobs and bills that would pass on a broad bipartisan basis. Last week, I highlighted 15 such bills the House already passed and that Senate Democrats should take up. This week, Senate Republicans will highlight several additional such bills the House passed just last week. We're going to keep on talking about these bills until Senate Democrats realize there's no reason we shouldn't take them up, pass them on a bipartisan basis, and actually do something on jobs around here. For nearly three years, President Obama has demanded that we pass massive legislation he knows Republicans have problems with. What they're saying is, let's start with things that have, what we're saying is, let's start with things that have bipartisan support that we know can pass instead of that other approach. Since Republicans control the House and Democrats control the Senate, we're not likely to agree on big partisan stuff. But there are a lot of other job-creating measures that we actually could agree on. Why don't we focus on them? Let's work together on the things we can all agree on, just like we did last month, on the trade agreements. Here's just one example out of many. Last week, the House passed a bill called the Small Company Capital Formation Act, H.R. 1070. It got 421 votes, including 183 Democrats. Only one person in the House voted against the bill. Here's a jobs bill that's about as popular as Mother's Day. There's no reason not to pass it in the Senate right now. Right now, promising businesses aren't going public because they simply can't afford the high cost of managing the mountain of government paperwork they're required to under current law. So instead of going out there and raising money to grow and hire, they're holding back. They're not expanding, and they're not hiring. We recently heard from a CEO of a pharmaceutical company in Fort Washington, Pennsylvania, who said private companies like his are at a major disadvantage. If they come up at a major disadvantage if they come up promising new drugs. He's got at least one such promising new drug in the pipeline for chronic kidney disease, but can't take it to the next level. If firms like this want to expand and hire, they need to be able to raise capital from investors so they don't go into debt. But current law keeps them from doing so because of all the regulatory burdens that come along with it. Well, I think we should be removing these barriers to growth for companies like this one. And 183 Democrats in the House actually agreed with me. President Obama actually supports the idea, too. He said so in his speech to a joint session of Congress back in September. So this bill is as bipartisan as it gets. You won't find a bill any more bipartisan than this. Passed overwhelmingly in the House, supported by the President of the United States. The only thing standing in the way right now is Senate Democrats. They just won't take yes for an answer. But it's only a matter of time before the American people catch on to the Democrats' refusal to act. And once they do, Republicans will be ready with a long and growing list of bipartisan bills that have already passed the House and that we believe the President of the United States would sign. So let's not delay any longer. Let's stop the games. Let's do the work we were sent here to do. Mr. President, I suggest the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
weekend in a quorum call here on the floor of the Senate considering giving tax breaks to businesses that hire veterans. President Obama announced those tax breaks today from the Rose Garden, saying he expects both parties to back the plan in support of veterans who fought for their country. If you missed the president's remarks from earlier, you can see those online anytime at the C-SPAN video library. And those tax credits are expected to be offered this week in an amendment by Senator Patty Murray of Washington. You're watching live coverage of the Senate here on C-SPAN 2.
with senators permitted to speak therein up to 10 minutes each. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
without objection. Mr. President, I come to the floor today to talk about creating more good-paying jobs in America and how tax reform can play a key role in job creation if it's done right. And Mr. President, as we all know, no member of Congress has a piece of machinery on their desk that's just a job creation device. You can't just start something like this up, press a button, and then after it whirs around a bunch of times, create a lot of new jobs. The new jobs don't just come shooting out that way. Nobody has a contraption like that here in the Senate, and the reality is the President doesn't have one, nor does anybody else in America. But there are policies that are relevant to how you create more good-paying jobs, and those involve, first, looking at what's worked in the past, and second, what hard, objective data is relevant to the future. Now, nobody can know the ideal surefire way to create jobs, but we can document what has worked in the past. In the case of comprehensive tax reform, what we know is that after the 1986 Tax Reform Act, where Democrats and Republicans went in and cleaned out scores of tax preferences to hold down marginal rates and keep progressivity, our country created 6.3 million new jobs in those two years after tax reform was enacted. Now, I'm not going to say on the floor of the Senate, Mr. President, that each and every one of those jobs was the result of tax reform. But certainly, independent authorities point to that tax reform effort as a key factor in creating those jobs. And with at least 14 million Americans out of work in our country right now, it would be legislative malpractice for Congress to ignore the facts that document the results of the last tax reform effort in job creation. Shouldn't, when we look at the possibilities, pay special attention to what has worked in the past? The reality is, as the President of the Senate knows, our country's tried just about every other tool in the economic toolbox. We've seen the Recovery Act. We've seen the Fed. The Fed is essentially all in with its program of quantitative easing. We've had a whole host of other initiatives in the housing area, in the automobile area, and a whole host of other areas. So the fact is, the one tool in the economic tool shed that nobody has picked up is fundamental tax reform. And it's my view that it's time for the Congress, working with the President, to pick up on a proven model that a host of progressive Democrats and conservative Republicans, led by a conservative Republican President, deployed 25 years ago to spur economic growth and create millions of new jobs, which I think we all understand our people and our economy need desperately. So given that success, it's no wonder that Democrats and Republicans, as well as economists and think tanks and bipartisan commissions, are again calling for the Congress to take up the cause of tax reform. And we're very hopeful that the Bipartisan Joint Committee on Deficit Reduction can also bring together Democrats and Republicans as part of their work to lay out the strategy for moving ahead on tax reform. Now, there is no shortage of good reasons for Congress to look at this particular approach to job creation. It's bipartisan. It's been proven before, and certainly the basic principles, simplifying the tax code, cleaning out the clutter, and holding down rates across the board make just as much sense today as they did a quarter century ago. It's been argued, Mr. President, that since the last change in our tax law, 
there have been close to 15,000 tax changes, one for almost every working day, year in and year out. And so what we have on our hands now is a dysfunctional, anti-growth mess. And that's why I think it's particularly important that we look at moving now rather than waiting until another election or taking a detour to reform only the corporate tax code while, for example, leaving small businesses and working families stuck with the same broken tax code they have today. And let me point out, Mr. President, that to those who say that you can't do tax reform in a divisive a climate, a divided Congress and White House, as you move into an election, the fact of the matter is that fundamental tax reform was passed on the eve of an election, a quarter century ago, passed on the eve of an election because I know that one of the fundamental architects of that tax reform, Senator Packwood, whose seat I now hold in the Senate, wasn't available for the bill signing because he had a community event that he had to get to back home. So the fact is, there's an opportunity now to move ahead with comprehensive tax reform. We've got very good people who have expertise in tax law on the super uh, committee, Chairman Baucus, Senator Kerry, uh, Congressman Camp, uh, Senator Portman, Democrats and Republicans who've been involved in budget and tax issues for years uh, and years with great uh, expertise on these uh, issues. And I wanted to take just a minute uh, this afternoon to discuss some eye-opening new information on an issue that I know is being uh, debated in the Congress. And my sense is the super committee is looking at it as well, and that is the question of splitting up tax reform into separate corporate and individual uh, pieces. Last week, the Joint Committee on Taxation issued an important report that all members ought to pay cl close attention to as Congress looks at tax reform as part of either a potential debt deal or other legislation. And the reason I wanted to discuss it this afternoon, Mr. President, is we all understand that as part of the legislative process, just about everything is negotiable. But there is one thing that isn't negotiable, and that is the accuracy of the numbers. And when the official number cruncher for taxes says that you can't make the numbers add up, members of the Senate and the Congress have got to pay some attention. What the new report by the Joint Committee on Taxation says, and of course they're the official scorekeeper for tax policy, is that the Congress essentially has a choice to make. We can either provide all American companies significantly lower tax rates, or we can allow multinational companies to continue to avoid paying taxes on their overseas income. But what the Joint Committee on Taxation says is that it's really not possible to do both. There is not enough money in the corporate tax code to do both without further increasing the budget deficit. The Joint Committee was asked to provide its estimate of the lowest corporate rate that could be achieved by eliminating corporate tax expenditures, the various credits, deductions, and exemptions that lower the actual amount of taxes our businesses pay. In response, the Joint Committee estimated that 28 percent is the lowest possible corporate rate that could be achieved from eliminating corporate tax breaks and still not increase the deficit, in effect be revenue neutral. Now 28 percent is certainly lower than the current top rate, but it's higher than certainly many in the business community and the Congress have argued is needed for U.S. companies to be competitive in the global economy. Most in the business community want to lower the top rate to 25 percent or even lower. The Joint Committee has determined that 28 percent is the lowest the corporate rate can be reduced to without adding to the deficit. Now this new report by the Joint Committee on Taxation ought to be a real wake-up call here in Washington, D.C. 
For example, many companies not only argue that Congress can get the corporate rate down to 25 percent or even lower, but also want to keep many of the tax breaks they now get under the current tax code. The Joint Committee's report makes clear that cannot be done without increasing the federal deficit. And even the Joint Committee's 28 percent rate estimate was filled with sort of caveats, little kind of look out there, maybe more to the story kind of uh, warnings about the difficulty of limiting tax breaks now available to all businesses so they can no longer be claimed by corporations. If tax breaks are eliminated for corporations, but not for other businesses, remember most businesses as we know are sole proprietors or limited uh, uh, partnerships and LLCs and the like, corporations may end up converting their businesses into other uh, types of tax structures. If that happens, the savings from eliminating corporate tax rates would be less so, so that the corporate uh, rate could end up even higher than 28 percent. That's just one example of how it is very hard to repeal tax breaks just for corporations and not for other businesses. Now, in making their estimate, the Joint Committee looked at repealing literally scores of corporate tax breaks. Everything from research to specific breaks for energy and housing and transportation and education and training and others. But there is one important tax break that was not considered as, point of the joint, as part of the Joint Committee's analysis, and that is the ability of U.S. multinationals to avoid paying taxes on their overseas income as long as they keep that money overseas. This is the tax break that is known as deferral. Significantly, the Joint Committee has done a separate analysis of the amount of revenue that could be generated by repealing deferral. If you repealed deferral and imposed related limits on foreign credits to prevent gaming, and the, you take that step and the total comes to an eye-popping $568 billion over five years. That estimate, Mr. President, comes from an estimate that the Joint Committee has done for a bipartisan group of us that have been working on this issue for the last five years. I initially started working on this with our former colleague from New Hampshire, Senator Gregg, most recently with Senator Coates and Senator Begich. But four of us have worked very closely on this over the last uh, you know, few years and if you make the change that we've made in deferral and related foreign credits that you ought to change to prevent a gaming, it is possible, Mr. President, to slash the rate for all businesses, all our businesses, so that you can get uh, down to 24 uh, percent, particularly for the corporate rate, have additional relief uh, for small businesses. Mr. President, we've got some ideas for how you could drive the rate lower than 24. Now that's something that I think could be a real shot in the arm to businesses in Connecticut and Oregon across the country. And it sure would do something about creating red, white, and blue jobs so that we'd have more jobs here in the United States. We could put our people back to work in the manufacturing sector and the other parts of our economy that are so important. So that's really the choice, Mr. President, according to the Joint Committee's estimate. And these are the official scorekeepers for taxes. There are two alternative ways to lower corporate you know, tax rates. One keeps deferral, this break for doing business overseas. And then the lowest rate, according to the Joint Committee on Taxation, would be 28 percent. The other takes away the tax breaks for shipping jobs overseas, eliminates deferral, and dramatically drives the rate for our businesses down to 24 percent. And as I've indicated, our bipartisan coalition has some ideas for getting it even lower. So it's important to point out that the lower 24% rate would apply to every U.S. company, 
every U.S. company, whether it has overseas operations or not. U.S. manufacturers and retailers and other domestic businesses all would benefit from this kind of approach. With lower tax rates, all U.S. businesses would have more money to invest in new equipment and hiring workers here in our country, in Connecticut, in Oregon, in all of our states. By contrast, while all businesses would get some help from a 28% rate, the biggest winners are those with significant operations overseas, thousands and thousands of miles from our shores. By continuing deferral, those businesses that operate overseas, those companies pay a zero rate on their overseas income. With that rate differential, there would still be a strong incentive for some of those very large uh, businesses to target their investments to lower tax overseas operations at the expense of investment and job creation here at home. So, Mr. President, it should be obvious that the last thing the Congress ought to be doing in this current economic climate is to take actions that will hurt job creation. With so many people out of work, we obviously need to focus on steps to create jobs not reward those that, in effect, ship the jobs overseas, ship the investments overseas, the investments and the jobs that we need so much here at home. We can do more for all U.S. businesses, workers, and their family through comprehensive tax reform than just by going forward with corporate-only reform. In fact, it's possible to do more for businesses, get a lower rate, President, I want to emphasize this, a lower rate for all our businesses in America, significantly lower, so they'll be more competitive in tough you know, global markets. I'm not saying that tax policy is the only consideration in terms of creating jobs. I chair the Trade Subcommittee of the Senate Finance Committee, and I've long taken as my major objective to do more to grow things here in America, to make things here in America, to add value to them here, and to ship them somewhere. So there are a whole host of trade and regulatory policies that factor uh, into this. But certainly we ought to agree that at a time when comprehensive tax reform is the one tool in the economic tool shed that hasn't been used, and there's a chance to take away tax breaks for shipping jobs overseas so we can get more tax relief for Americans here at home, we ought to be uh, picking up on that opportunity. So I hope all colleagues who are going to be part of this tax reform debate over the next uh, a few weeks, and I think it's inevitable because more and more debate is focused on tax reform, whether it ought to be corporate uh, only, how you would go about uh, pursuing it uh, in a bipartisan way. I hope those colleagues will take a look at the new report uh, done by the Joint Committee uh, on Taxation. What they have made clear is that there isn't enough money in the corporate tax code to get the lower rate companies want as long as some of these multinationals can continue to keep the money overseas and avoid paying U.S. Uh, taxes. Mr. President, having worked on this issue with colleagues on both sides of the aisle for about the last five years, and watching as the economic debate goes forward with our people hungry for new jobs, I hope colleagues will see, one, that there is a real lesson to be learned from what was done in 1986, where progressive Democrats and conservative Republicans came together, came together on the eve of an election, by the way, the 1986 uh, election. I think it's also fair to say, Mr. President, that after tax reform, both sides did pretty well. Both sides did pretty well in the Congress and in terms of controlling uh, the White House. So the fact is, this is a chance to take a big step to help our people who are hurting now, 14 million uh, out of work. And I hope colleagues will look at that new report prepared by the Joint Committee on Taxation and look at the history of how in the two years, a quarter century ago, 
when we came together, Democrats and Republicans, and passed fundamental tax reform based on the same kinds of principles that Senator Gregg and Senator Coates and Senator Begich and I have worked on for the last five years, cleaning out special interest breaks, special interest preferences, cleaning out scores of them, using that money to hold down marginal rates, and keeping progressivity. So we have the sense of fairness. Everybody wins, Mr. President. Many of our colleagues on our side of the aisle, Mr. President, feel passionately about economic fairness. I certainly do. I know the President of the Senate does as well. Many of our colleagues on the other side of the aisle have focused on economic opportunity. With fundamental tax reform, we can have both, and we can do it in a bipartisan way. And it means picking up on the one tool in the economic tool shed that hasn't been used. So I'll be back on the floor of this Senate, Mr. President, to talk about this uh, again. It's one of the reasons why I wanted so to serve on the Senate Finance Committee to tackle these fundamental issues of taxes and uh, health care. We've had a very constructive set of hearings on tax reform chaired by uh, Chairman Baucus and ranking minority member uh, Senator uh, Hatch. And I'm just very hopeful that at a time when our people are so hungry for new jobs, good jobs, high paying jobs, that we will pick up on this opportunity to bring Democrats and Republicans together, together as we were on this issue a quarter century ago, and enact fundamental tax reform. Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor, and I also uh, note, Mr. President, the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Cockroft.
And while the Senate's in a quorum call, I'll let you know they'll be working on a bill dealing with the 3% government withholding from federal contractors. That's going to start at 5 Eastern time with a vote to move forward with the measure at 530. And also let you know on the C-SPAN networks today, some live programs to tell you about on our companion network. Later tonight, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright will host a forum on the Arab Spring from the National Democratic Institute. And that gets underway at 5 Eastern on our companion network, C-SPAN. And we'll also hear from CBS Chief Foreign Correspondent Lara Logan as she speaks at George Washington University about covering conflicts. And that'll be live C-SPAN coverage starting at 8 Eastern, also on C-SPAN. Watching live coverage from the floor of the U.S. Senate right here on C-SPAN 2.